Go ahead, Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Eric tonight. I am not Alex. Welcome to the Astro Imaging channel tonight. Uh, I don't have a lot of introduction like Alex usually does, so we'll just mention a couple of things. Uh, be sure that we have, let's see, we have another month, month and a half to turn in your gorgeous galaxies. We have a number of really nice submissions, so keep them coming. This is galaxy season. There's a lot of nice things out there like M106, which we're just waiting for you guys to submit. And other than that, the only thing I want to do now is introduce uh, Casey Good, who's our speaker tonight. Uh, Casey is a CPA and he's going to talk to us about the financial matters regarding astrophotography. Uh, and at that point, everyone, you can all disconnect. No, no, he's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. That was just, that was just my odd humor. Casey is uh, at a place that we all really envy and would like to be. He's up on Kitt Peak and he handles all of the outreach for that and gets to play with those big telescopes in very dark skies on top of a big mountain. So I think without much more introduction, Casey, if you're ready, you know, take it away. All right, thanks, Eric. Let me just share my screen real quick and get the PowerPoint going. Alrighty, I think everybody can now see the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, like Eric mentioned, my name is Casey Good. I'm the astrophotography coordinator for the Kid Peak National Observatory. Uh, you can find my website online at www.goodastronomy-astronomy.com and on social media at Good Astronomy. So just a quick bio on myself. Um, I've been an astrophotographer since 2014. I started in the backyard along with everyone else that's probably on this stream right now. And uh, in 2015, I was lucky enough to be hired by the Kitt Peak National Observatory, where I took over as the astrophotography coordinator and have been running our astrophotography programs ever since. Along with working at Kitt Peak, I myself have two remote systems with my good friend Steve Timmons out in Texas next to the McDonald Observatory. One of them is in the picture right there. Since we're all astrophotographers, I'd like to brag a little bit. That's a Stellar View 130 with the new 2600 mono camera. We also have a CDK 14 out there. Um, I also haven't given up everything completely for remote. I have a little telescope in my backyard I still have fun with because, you know, we all have that itch to get out there every once in a while. And I have one very understanding wife who lets me do all of this miraculously. And then finally, finally like uh, Eric said, I'm a professional bean counter. I'm the CFO of a hospital by trade. Um, so this is something that I do as a hobby and just for fun on the weekends. Um, but let's get started and talk about Kit Peak and what we have in store for everyone, everybody in the 2020s. So I wanted to talk about a brief history and the scientific operations of what's happening at Kit Peak in the 2020s. And then we'll switch gears to the visitor center operations and then talk about what opportunities there are for all the fellow astrophotographers that are out there. If you ever are lucky enough to make it out here to beautiful Tucson, and get up under our nice dark skies. Um, so Kitt Peak was actually established in 1958 under a contract from the National Science Foundation and administered by a nonprofit called ARA. And it was developed because there was a need back in the 1950s for telescopes and observatories that were not owned solely by one or two universities that could be used by anybody that had a valid um, idea needed to test out the science related to astronomy that uh, may not have had their own really nice telescope on a nearby mountain. So Kitt Peak in particular was chosen because of the excellent conditions that we typically have here in Tucson. We um, frequently have clear skies, about 300 days of sunshine down here. Um, excellent, excellent seeing conditions as well. It's typically not too windy. Um, it's a nice southern location, so we get a good swath of the sky. And right nearby, we have the University of Arizona that had the Lunar and Planetary Lab and the Stewart Observatory, where we could also um, take a bunch of grad students to help run all these telescopes, which was super helpful. And we still have a lot of grad students up on the mountain today. Part of where we're at is unique, though, that we're on the Tohono O'odham Reservation. Uh, it's the Tohono O'odham Nation's land. It's actually the second most uh, religious 
um, area in their entire culture, and they graciously allow us to be there. It is probably one of the only instances in the country of the federal government leasing land from it back from an Indian nation. And so we have a really, really great relationship with the tribe. And I, again, they've allowed us to be there for over 50 years. Um, Kitt Peak is the largest collection of telescopes on any mountaintop, almost anywhere in the world. We certainly are in the Northern Hemisphere and we're getting close to being the only one uh, or the largest collection on any mountaintop anywhere in the world. Currently, we have 22 optical observatories, two radio observatories, and then four visitor center observatories that are used just for our public outreach activities. And hopefully we have a fifth one coming soon. And that fifth one is going to push us over and we'll have uh, more telescopes on a mountain than Cerro Tololo down in Chile. So I'm looking forward to having that title back. So I just wanted to talk about some of the major scientific endeavors that Kipi is um, working on in the 2020s. And it starts with our largest telescope on the mountain, the four meter mile telescope. This again is the largest telescope that we have up on Kip Peak. Uh, it saw first light back in 1973. And at the time it was the second largest telescope in the world. When it was built, it was meant to have a focus on large scale structures of the universe and to further our understanding of those large structures that are out there. Um, it's also used to document the rotational speed of galaxies in search of dark matter. And there's actually an identical twin of this telescope called uh, the Blanco telescope on Cerro Tololo down in Chile. So these two twin telescopes have full view of the entire night sky. Um, so what we're doing now with this telescope is over the last couple of years, we had received a grant from the Department of Energy or something called the Dark Energy Spectrograph Instrument, which we lovingly refer to as DESI. And it is an optical spectrometer that's tasked to understand the effect that dark energy and dark matter have throughout the universe. And it's gonna be one of the only telescopes of its kind that's dedicated to studying this 24 seven, 365 days of the year, as long as it's not cloudy. Um, this is a very, very special spectrograph that can actually take um, individual spectra of, ga of 5,000 galaxies or other objects at one single time, just based on the design of the telescope, which I have a picture of right over here. And the goal of the DESI instrument is to create the largest 3D map in existence of dark energy and dark matter in the universe. And it's gonna do that by measuring tens of millions of galaxies all the way out to 11 billion light years away within the galaxy to make the most expansive map that we have to hopefully solve that question, what is dark energy and what is dark matter? And it's gonna have this, this program is going to be running for about 10 years. So here's a picture of the DESI instrument at the very top of Kitt Peak, the four meter mile telescope, when it's at that, um, the focus on the top of the instrument is actually an F 2.7 instrument. So think of this as like a giant 163 inch hyperstar. And on the top right, you can see just one piece of the pie that sits on that camera or that spectrograph. And there's little rows to move the fiber optic wires to take those individual measurements of those distant galaxies. So one of the reasons that we were chosen is because this telescope, when it was built, you can see on the bottom right, it's built like a tank. It's like one of the only telescopes in the survey that could have supported a several ton instrument sitting on the top of the telescope. Um, so it's a fantastic project. We started getting commissioning on, on the instrument. This was actually the first light commissioning from the DESI spectrograph. And here you can see those pieces of the pie laid out and where all those 5,000 fiber optic cables are taking measurements. Um, this was near the uh, Triangulum Galaxy M33. And this was the first light that we got out of the instrument on uh, October 22nd of 2019. So as we all know, COVID struck in 2020. We're still feeling the effects of it. Uh, the commissioning first light and the entire telescope was supposed to be ready in March of 2020. And so 
the very last night before we shut down, Desi got one full night on the sky and it was able to take the spectra of 125,000 objects on March 14th alone. So the power of this telescope to make scientific measurements throughout the entire universe is amazing. And uh, we look forward to what it's going to be doing for us once the observatory is back up and running in full. Um, Kit Peak, because of COVID, is still close to the public right now, but the scientific operations resumed in October of 2020 and Desi got back online in the spring of 21, just a couple months ago. So it is currently up and running. All right, our second largest telescope is the WIN 3.5 meter observatory. It is the newest telescope on Kitt Peak. Um, it was built in the early 90s and the first light was seen in 1994. It's part of the WIN consortium, which stands for Wisconsin, Indiana, Yale, and now NASA, because NASA has a special new instrument on it that I'll talk about. Uh, but for those imagers of, out there, the uh, one degree imaging camera is one really, really cool instrument since you guys can actually appreciate um, the instrumentation on this one. The ODI is a 64 uh, mosaic CCD camera that has a resolution of about a tenth of an arc second per pixel. And on a 3.5 meter telescope, you can imagine it's very, very zoomed in. So down in the bottom right hand corner, you can see just a picture of M51 and this is what M51 looks like in the field of view of the 3.5 meter with a one degree imager on it. Absolutely crazy. Um, we can obviously have other infrared and spe uh, spectrographic instruments on this, but the newest one that we just put on right before COVID shut us down was the NUID spectrometer, which is a really, really special instrument that I want to highlight. So NUID stands for the NASA NSF Exoplanet or Explorer Exoplanet Investigations with Doppler Spectroscopy, which is why we just call it NUID. <laughs> it is the most sensitive spectrograph that's ever been made, where um, I have a little asterisk there because the, uh, uh, I remember right, ESO's HARP spectrograph can measure and detect uh, planets around other stars that are wobbling at a rate of 75 centimeters per second. And NUID can actually get down to 10 centimeters per second. Talk about how that relates in a minute. But basically this instrument was built to follow up on all of these exoplanet surveys that we're seeing being launched. So Kepler, we know that mission's over. And TESS that was launched by the ESO is uncovering thousands of exoplanets all the time through transiting phenomenon. But what's cool about NUID, or the, an example of the transit phenomenon is on the left where we get an eclipsing of a star from a planet. But the Doppler spectroscopy that NUID does is if we're not on a complete line of sight, we can actually observe the wobble that is induced by a planet that's orbiting that star. And so NUID was built to be so sensitive because we want to find Earth-sized planets in this manner. So to put this in perspective, Jupiter causes our sun to wobble at about 29 miles an hour. Us on Earth, we only cause uh, a quarter of a mile per hour wobble on our star. So to give you an example, because we live out here in the desert, um, a quarter of a mile is out as slow as a desert tortoise walking across a desert floor. But believe it or not, with NUID, we're going to be able to see that much of a wobble from a star caused by a planet at a distance of about 10,000 light years in our own galaxy. So the extreme precision that we're getting out of this instrument is just absolutely amazing. I can't wait to really get this thing going and see what kind of discoveries that we make in our nearby galaxy. So along with um, the four meter and the 3.5 meter, we also have our 2.1 meter, which is one of the most historic telescopes on Kitt Peak. It was the first major optical telescope that was built on Kitt Peak. It saw first light back in 1964. So it's pretty, pretty old. It's getting up near 60, <laughs> um, but it has a storied past with many, many discoveries. Um, this telescope was the very first one to detect intergalactic hydrogen gas that was out there in between galaxies 
it was the first telescope that was able to observe gravitational lensing that was put forth and postulated by Einstein. And it was the first observation of pulsating white dwarf. But one of the things it's most famous for is its role in the discovery of dark matter. I'm sure many of you have heard of the famous astronomer Vera Rubin, who was one of the pioneers of dark matter. She actually used this telescope quite frequently to study the rotational speeds of galaxies and realized that something wasn't quite right in terms of the mass distribution across the galaxies. And there had to be some kind of missing matter that was holding those stars together in spiral galaxies as they were spinning so fast. So again, this telescope has a very, very storied past, but we often get the question, what are we doing now? So over the last five or six years, uh, we have looked at the telescope inventory that we have on the mountain and said, okay, what can we do to modernize these telescopes and still make them relevant in, to, in modern astronomy when we have these giant telescopes being built down in Chile, like 30 and 40 meter telescopes? Well, first up, Caltech brought out an instrument called the Robotic Adaptive Optic System that created a false star in the atmosphere and was able to adjust the light that was coming into the telescope to achieve the best possible resolution. And we we're actually able to get this 2.1 meter telescope to behave on par with Hubble. So a telescope that's almost 60 years old was able to get a standing resolution almost on par with a space telescope. So after that successful experiment, they're putting that on a newer telescope out in Chile that's bigger, or actually Hawaii, I believe. Um, and in 2018 and to today, they have an instrument called um, SEDUM. That's the Spectral Energy Distribution Machine, which is basically a low-res, fast response spectrometer. Because we have all these survey instruments that are coming online in the 2020s, like the Vera Rubin telescope that's going to be able to take an image of the entire southern sky every 12 days. We have tons of transient events coming up that we need professional research grade telescopes to be able to rapidly research once their discovery is made. And so that's what the 2.1 meter is being dedicated to. In fact, several of the telescopes up at Kitt Peak will be tasked with these kinds of studies in the 2020s. Um, so that's a good overview of what's happening on three out of the 22 optical telescopes that are up at Kitt Peak for research purposes. But if you guys ever come up and make it out to Kitt Peak, I want to talk about what you can do as part of our visitor center programs, which is actually where I work. So if you come up during the daytime, the Kitt Peak Visitor Center operates much like a museum and a gift shop. So we have a lot of really cool exhibits that explain uh, the history of astronomy, the effects of light pollution, talks about the science related to how we're making all of these discoveries up at Kitt Peak. And of course, we can't send you home without like a Kitt Peak t-shirt. Um, but during the day, we're not really doing much because all of the astronomers are asleep. So we have daytime self-guided tours or docent-led tours of the McMath Solar Telescope, which is currently under construction. I'll talk about that in a minute. You can see the Caltech 2.1 meter up close with uh, the one that we just talked about, as well as get into the mile four meter. You can actually take an elevator 13 stories up to the Bay Telescope and go into the viewing gallery and get up close and personal with the four meter telescope and the DESI instrument. Now we do have self-guided tours of the entire mountain, but we also have VIP tours where a small group gets to go behind the scenes of Kitt Peak and actually get into these observatories and talk to some of the astronomers. Um, during a VIP tour, I mean, you get right up next to the telescopes and you can touch them. You're close enough to touch them, although we don't encourage that. Um, and then we also have um, a solar array for telescope viewing during the day for hydrogen alpha, calcium, and white light telescopes as part of one of our visitor center telescopes. However, the fun is just beginning at Kitt Peak as of the sun sets. The nighttime programs are where we really shine. Um, Kitt Peak was one of the first ones to create some of these nightly outreach programs back in the mid-90s. 
our famous nightly observing program happens every single night, uh, rain or shine, pretty much, with the exception of um, holidays like Christmas and Thanksgiving. Uh, the Dark Sky Discovery Program is meant for a more intimate group. The Night of the Marvelous Moon Program is meant for um, exploring the lunar surface. We have our Overnight Telescope Observing Programs and our Astrophotography Programs that are really geared towards this group. So I'll briefly, briefly talk about those. But uh, Molly, real quick, are there any questions so far? This is a good midpoint, I think. Uh, there is one question uh, from uh, Chandrasekhar. How do you determine the rotational speed of galaxies? That's a fantastic question. Um, typically, you're looking at the spectra of these specific stars or portions of the galaxy to see if they're redshifted or blue shifted on what side of the galaxy. Um, I have to remind everybody I'm an accountant by day and not an astrophysicist, but essentially it is um, all related to the spectra that's coming off of it and looking at those shifts. Okay. And yeah, I think that's the only question we've had so far. All right, cool. So I'll go ahead and jump into our array of nighttime programs. And by the way, that's me down at the bottom looking through our 20 inch telescope, which is one of the ones that you can use on our nighttime programs, which speaking of, so we have our solar telescope array during the day. That's one of the four observatories. And here are the other three observatories that we have just for you. Starting on the top left, we have our um, 16 inch Levine RC telescope that has 140 millimeter apple refractor piggyback on top. We, it's in a very little dome. We lovingly call it the little dome. And uh, it's meant for our small groups in our deep sky discovery program. It's an excellent, excellent visual instrument like uh, F9.1 or so. And then you'll probably notice the other two telescopes look very similar. They are a 16 inch and a 20 inch ARCOS RC telescopes. Um, the one on the left is probably my favorite observatory because it's our roll off roof observatory. So while uh, the camera or the telescope's busy taking pictures all night, you can actually sit underneath the portal one slash two skies and just observe visually. It's beautiful, beautiful views. And then piggybacked on top of that, we have a Tech 140, which is my personal favorite to use on the mountain. It's just so easy to toss a DSLR on that one and image for the entire night. And this is actually the one that we use as part of our astrophotography workshops. Um, saw a question, what is the local seeing? Um, it depends on where you are on the mountain, but we have sub arc second seeing all of the time, pretty much, unless it's a, a fairly bad night. But um, where the wind 3.5 meter telescope is, it's usually like less than half of an arc second seeing. So we can have those resolutions that are a 10th of an arc second per pixel with the CCD cameras. Sorry. And then Finally, on the right, you can see our 20 inch Arcos with a Takahashi 106 that's piggybacked on the back. And you can probably see that I have it currently set up for astro imaging with our on axis guider and our two CCD cameras ready for a night of capturing photons. So those are the three telescopes that we frequently use as part of our visitor center programs. Now the nightly observatory or the nightly observing program is what you may have done if you came up to Kit Peak for our nightly programs where it's very much meant to be an introductory program and a family oriented stargazing program for the public. So we assume that you don't have any experience in astronomy whatsoever. If this is the one that you wanna bring your mom and dad and uncle to that uh, ask you, you know, whether or not astrology and astronomy are the same thing, we'll set them straight with this program. Uh, but it's a five hour program where we come up, you get dinner, uh, we watch the sunset and talk about some thing about constellations using planospheres and star charts and how to star hop your way through the sky. So again, if you have that crazy uncle that's bothering you or um, you just want to come up to the hey, uh, Sorry, can you, I'm going to yeah. pause you for a second. I'm having some connection issues to YouTube. Um, sure. Let's see. Okay, it looks like it has resumed. Okay. Nobody's yelling at me on YouTube. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. It, it, yeah. It looks like, looks like it's, we're back up. <laughs> no I was probably clicking the time lapse a little too often. Uh, no, it was, it was something on my end. Don't worry about it. <laughs> So again, that nightly observing program, we've been running it for over 20 years, and it's a great way to get introduced to the local area and really just get to view through the telescope. Now, for this group that's probably watching the YouTube right now, I would highly recommend the Dark Sky Discovery Program. So this is a small group experience. It, we limit it to 8 to 10 people, and you and your group is paired with a guide that is very knowledgeable in the night sky. A lot of times it might be me. And uh, the telescopes, you get to use one of those two, three telescopes, excuse me. And for the entire four hours after sunset, um, you're just viewing through the telescope. So during a nightly observing program, you might only get to look at five, six objects through the telescope. The dark, dark sky discovery program, you can probably see upwards of 20 to 30, depending on how many questions or a conversation that's happening. Um, I've had groups up there that just want to talk about Star Trek the entire time while occasionally looking through the telescope, and that's fine. Um, but this is great for viewing the best of the Messier catalog and looking at other faint fuzzies and really getting an appreciation for the dark sky if you haven't looked through a really large aperture telescope before. So really, really fun. Um, when the moon's up in the sky, we have something called the Night of the Marvelous Moon which is an exploration of everything that the moon has to offer. Again, it's small groups, just like the Deep Sky Discovery Program, where we have extensive lunar imaging and viewing. Um, we start off in the classroom where we use um, LRO data to explore some of the famous landmarks like the Apollo lunar, um, lunar landing sites and take a look at some of the interesting geological features of the moon. And then we actually get out in, into that roll-off roof observatory typically where we'll have a CCD camera hooked up um, or a planetary camera typically. Um, and we'll take high resolution shots of the moon as well as looking through the telescope for it. So if you're a big fan of the moon, that's a program for you. But because you guys are astrophotographers, I wanted to spend most of the time talking about the astrophotography programs that we have to offer up at Kit Peak. So, let me preface this by saying that the visitor center programs have been closed since March of 2020. However, <clears throat> we're working to get these back online once the COVID pandemic has passed and it's safe to bring visitors up. Um, I have a feeling that the astrophotography programs will be some of the first ones that are open back up because it's limited group sizes, usually only eight to 10 people in the workshops rather than the 50 or 60 that come during the nightly outreach program. But we're looking at getting the Visitor Center back up and running uh, this fall, hopefully in just a couple more months. So, <clears throat> like I mentioned before, we have an array of astrophotography programs to offer to the general public. Starting off with our overnight telescope observing program, which I briefly mentioned before, but we also have workshops that <clears throat> I, um, I specifically created these workshops based on my experience of being frustrated as a beginner in the backyard with a brand new C8 and holding an iPhone up to the eyepiece. And going from that point to getting your first successful astrophotograph. So I designed these things from the ground up to make the best use of our time and hit the ground running um, with astrophotography, especially the intro astrophotography program. The intermediate is a little bit more advanced. We'll talk about that. Then we also have our remote astrophotography programs, which are brand new. We rolled those out right before COVID shut us down, but they are brand new still. And then we have several programs that are currently in development. We haven't really been having any idle time during the shutdown. We've had several programs in development and hopefully we'll be bringing those online quickly after we start reopening. So starting off with the Overnight Telescope Observing Program. <clears throat> it's an exclusive, customized, private program for you and your group of guests that you come up to the mountain. So you actually are renting one of our three observatories for the entire night. So you make these reservations usually about three to six months in advance, where you and your party will take over the entire observatory after the public outreach portion of the evening ends. So let's say it's sometime in October and the sun sets around six, you are going to be in the observatory around 8.30ish and you get to go until you drop 
or the sun rises. And the observatory is yours to do with what you want. If you want to have it strictly visual, you can totally just look through the telescope the entire night. I've done that. It's a lot of fun. If you're big into sketching, we have several people that will come and uh, just use the telescope and sketch all the Messier programs, have their own Messier marathon. Uh, the guide is with you all night and explaining everything. They're operating the telescope for you based on what you're wanting to do. Um, typically what we have in this program is people that want to use kind of a mix of the two where you spend a couple hours in the early evening viewing visually through the telescopes and kind of exploring the sky. And then as it gets later on in the evening and early morning hours, if people are starting to get a little bit tired and want to go to bed, we'll throw like a DSLR or one of the CCD cameras onto the telescope and actually use it to image for the night. Um, very, very common to throw like the, we have Canon 60 DAs and I'm looking at getting some of those new um, uh, mirrorless cannons, the RAs up there. Well, we'll just throw it on the Takahashi FSQ, for example, and set it off to image uh, for a couple hours until the sun rises. Um, it's a really cool program because during the program, you're actually staying on the mountain overnight in the same uh, dormitories as the visiting astronomers. You're gonna be eating dinner and breakfast with the astronomers. Frequently, they'll be at the next table and they hear your visitor. And I don't know if you guys have met a lot of astronomers in person, but they love talking about what they're doing, especially for like us amateurs that kind of have an inkling of what is happening and some of the science that's out there. The fact that you can talk at a good level with them, they will just talk your ear off. <laughs> and before you know it, it'll be time to run to the telescope and get set up for the night. So it's a really, really unique program where you get that kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction with people on the mountain. Um, it can be one night. We have people that will rent it for like an entire weekend. It just depends on your needs and uh, how much you want to spend really coming out to the program. But really, really cool program. You get to pick any one of our three observatories to rent for the night. And uh, we also, in tandem with that, we'll have our remote um, telescopes online with that so you can we're expanding the program to where you can view visually through some of those telescopes. We'll also have our remote telescope open to you to be imaging at the same time. So we're really trying to expand this program because it's one of the most popular programs we offer. So here's a, just a quick example of some of the images that we've gotten from the OTOP images. These top two, obviously M45 and M8. Uh, <clears throat> these are situations where, like I said, people were getting kind of worn out coming from the East Coast to the West Coast. Around three o'clock in the morning, they're like, we're going to bed, why don't you take some pretty pictures for us? And so we throw the Canon 60 DA on and got two or three hours on the Pleiades. And again, being in a Bortle 1 with the FSQ, it's awesome to image with. You get a lot of those really bright targets and really flushed out images. We can also do planetary with a 20 inch telescope. So um, during the oppositions, like when Mars was in opposition or um, some of the crazy transits that are out there, we've done a lot of uh, planetary imaging as part of the OTOP as well, which is really cool. All right, now on to my babies, the astrophotography workshops. So, like I mentioned before, we have an introduction to astrophotography workshop that I designed to basically assume that you have never touched a camera in your life. And by the time you leave, you'll know how to take an astrophotograph. That was my goal in coming up with this program. So, we talk about the types of astrophotography that exist out there. So, obviously, there's deep sky, as we all know. But uh, there's also solar system uh, astrophotography, like planetary, and that's often where a lot of people get their start is in this type of photography, because we probably all have like a C6 or a C8 that we have. And it's really easy to throw like a ZW or a QHY onto it and get some really beautiful planetary shots. Uh, we talk about solar imaging. We have a whole section and uh, actually bring in a friend of mine named Ron Cottrell, who's a much better solar imager than I am. And uh, we use our solar arrays for imaging. So we've done calcium imaging, we've done hydrogen alpha imaging, white light solar imaging. So even during the day, we're imaging at night, we're imaging all night. Um, and we also talk about nightscapes. We actually encourage everybody to bring up their own tripod and DSLR. And if you have a star tracker, that's great. 
because after the classroom portion is done and after we've set up the telescope, the Kit Peak telescope to image all night, we will also just walk around the mountain if the Milky Way is out and get these beautiful nightscapes. And I think it's the funniest thing, like people come to this workshop and this is the part that they love the most is just walking around at 2 a.m. in the morning on a mountaintop where you have like, all these professional observatories are the foreground of these beautiful Milky Way shots. Um, and even in the intermediate, we do that too. So that part's a ton of fun, but specifically we talk about the basics of equipment that you need to get started in astrophotography. Um, we're very budget conscious as well. I like to encourage everybody to use what they have on hand before they go out and buy a Paramount Mighty or something like that. And although I know that there's probably some of you that are listening right now that took that path, not knocking it at all, but uh, starting from the basics, like how to polar align. Like I bring up um, my Celestron AVX that I started with or my EQ6R Pro, and we actually look through the polar scopes and figure out how to manually polar align in the field and how to balance a telescope you know, how to put the counterweights on and make sure your deck and RA axis are balanced well enough. We'll talk about cable management. We'll talk about backspacing and how to figure some of that stuff out. So really what you need to know to get started in the field. And then of course, part of that is going to be the software associated with getting started. So we have um, Backyard, EOS and Backyard Nikon, which I'm sure a lot of you have used, and it's a great, great program for image capture for somebody who's not really familiar with it. We also just have plain old intervalometers. So you literally are sitting there just clicking the button to take the pictures and holding it for 30 seconds. So we teach everybody about Backyard EOS. For planetary, we use SharpCap and Fire Capture. Um, and then PhD2, we talk about guiding as well. And we get the main telescopes, um, the Kit Peak telescopes guiding using PhD2. So we, again, are starting off as if you don't know anything and teaching you how to get up and running in the field. Um, we also spend the daytime when we're not doing the solar imaging, talking about processing software like Registax and Star Tools, which are the two primary ones that we'll use. Uh, and yeah, see, uh, HDI stacker as well. Can so. I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, you were talking a few minutes ago about making reservations, and I imagine as an astrophotographer, those nights which are moonless or nearly moonless are the most desirable. How far in advance do they fill up? Right before COVID, we were taking reservations up to nine months out. <laughs> So we we do fill up pretty quick because um, we only have a limited number of guides right now that can operate the telescopes uh, for astrophotography. And so it's a combination of using those prime nights that you were talking about, Eric, as well as having a guide um, that's knowledgeable in operating the equipment well enough to satisfy somebody that's coming out to use a 20 inch telescope and a CCD. Are you taking reservations now nine months in advance? We are not taking reservations just yet because the visitor center staff is still um, not working right now. So we are going to make an announcement on our social media pages once we get back up and running. Um, the problem is the unknown portion of COVID when we're going to be able to safely open back up to the public. I'm hoping that we're going to start taking reservations around the September timeframe. And uh, obviously there won't be anybody available um, or there won't be anybody who's it's been shut down for so long. So you don't need to go three months in advance per se. So are you, have you discussed what kind of rules you're going to have as far as vaccination or masking? Or? We have. Um, it's still something that's highly in development, but the National Science Foundation is kind of dictating um, how our reopening is going to happen um, in terms of sanitizing the eyepieces in between people looking through them, um, masking mandates, vaccination mandates. It's still kind of up in the air, but it is going to be some level of restriction until, um, you know, COVID just becomes like a seasonal flu kind of thing. So 
it's definitely something we're working on, but we're not going to open up too fast and jeopardize the safety of our visitors and employees. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, all righty. So, like I said, we do all the intro to the processing softwares, and then um, we actually will use the Kit Peak uh, telescopes. So. We don't schedule any OTOPs on the nights that I'm doing an astrography workshop, which are usually around a quarter moon. So um, we have use of all three of the telescopes to where we can have two of them imaging and then visually going through a third. Or if it's during Milky Way season, we can just walk around and take pictures of the Milky Way. But here's a couple of examples of some of the images that we've gotten through the intro workshop. Again, a beautiful, image of the sun through the calcium telescope, some Milky Ways with some red light painting in the foreground that, again, because it's a professional observatory, weren't light painting. These were already there by the observatory. Um, and then the, obviously, Jupiter with some of the moons in the red spot, and then the triangular galaxy that my intro group took really early on. I think this was about four years ago now. So some examples of types of images that you go home with and knowing how to do. And then there's the astro intermediate astrophotography workshop. This is the fun one because this is probably geared towards everybody um, that has been in the hobby for a while. It's focused just on deep sky astrophotography. So there's no solar, no planetary, no Milky Way landscapes unless it happens to be up after the workshop. We're devoted and solely focused on imaging the deep sky. And so in this workshop, during the classroom portions of it during the day, we talk about current trends in the hobby, um, especially over the last couple of years, the CMOS versus CCD debate, how that's evolving, um, how, you know, just all the fast telescopes that are coming out. We talk about equipment optimization and theory. So talking about the Nyquist theory of sampling and why you need to build a system that samples at one third to one half of your average seeing and how to figure out what your average seeing is in your primary imaging locations and starting to think about how you're going to optimize your system to get the best out of every clear night that you can get. Uh, we talk about remote telescope operations. Like I mentioned before, I've now built two remote observatories, built a backyard <laughs> observatory, and it's been a huge, huge learning experience. Like my friend Steve and I can tell you, it uh, never really goes quite as planned <laughs> once you're there. You have to uh, really think this stuff through in advance. And so really using that system optimization as part of the planning and implementation of a remote observatory and using programs like the SkyX or Voyager or Sequence Generator Pro and the pros and cons of those types of um, operations. Then we talk about um, a big portion of the class, at least half of the class, is image processing and Pix Insight. Because I realized a while ago that there was a demand, um, especially before Warren Keller wrote his fabulous Insight Pix Insight book, uh, that there was terrible documentation about Pix Insight. Everyone wanted to learn it. It is an amazingly powerful program for our hobby. There's not a lot of good ways to go about learning it. And so half of the workshop, again, very much similar to the intro workshop, I assume that you've never seen Pix Insight. And we talk about how the user interface works. We go through a recommended workflow, um, again, kind of modeled off of Warren's, and I know he presented it a couple of weeks ago on the Astro Imaging channel, um, but pretty much start to finish how to get a good image in a you know, limited number of steps um, for pretty much any image that you'll start off with until you really start learning what the person is doing behind the scenes. I try to explain what deconvolution is attempting to do in the system and why or what it may or may not work on some of your images. And then, of course, just like the other program, we're going to have acquisition and visual use using those KIPI Visitor Center telescopes. And if it happens to be cloudy during the workshops, we still have the workshops. But the nice thing is I have the remote observatories as well that we can use. And hopefully a couple of states over, it'll be just fine. And then one other really cool thing about the astrophotography workshops, during the second day, we actually have a VIP tour scheduled for all the attendees. 
So you guys are going from pretty much eight o'clock in the morning until midnight, unless you want to shoot Milky Way, then you might go until three o'clock in the morning. Uh, but you get to go behind the scenes and like, for example, on one of them, I was able to like get up into the solar telescope and the radio telescopes with the group. And um, now that the four meters back up and running, we can get up close and personal with all the equipment. It's just a really, really cool experience. And it's a three day workshop. Um, both of the workshops go from Friday to Sunday. So here's some of the images that we've pulled or the types of images that we'll do as part of the intermediate workshop. We talk about narrowband processing, using narrowband filters, what the SHO palette is, how to process that. Uh, we started to delve into commentary. Um, I was getting ready for Neo NeoWise and other comments, um, but we briefly briefly touch on that i think i need another workshop entirely just for commentary stuff if you guys know how that goes um and one of the new things that we just came out with is the remote astrophotography programs uh again this came out right before hippie shutdown but we were able to run it for about two weeks uh currently we have two configurations where if you can't make it out to Peak, you can use some of our telescopes that will be up on Kit Peak. Uh, we were using a Takahashi 180D paired with a one-shot color camera. Uh, piggybacked on that was a Red Cat 51 with uh, APSH chip that is SBIG 16200. Um, we actually have a 12 and a half inch RC that is built and ready to go. It's just up on Git Peak. So once that opens up to the visitor center staff, that'll be coming online. And then I'll talk about this in a couple of slides, but we have a 24 inch RC that's coming in the near future as well. So the way that we structure the, re the remote astrophotography programs is you rent the telescope for the whole night and you control it through um, through the internet. And the program name is escaping me right now. Um, but you can tr set up your run through the internet and there's a guide that's on call all night with you in case something goes wrong with the telescope. But you basically program in the object the filters, the exposure time, whatever you want for the night that you rent it. And in the morning, you get the entire data sets and all of the um, calibration frames to go with it. All right, so upcoming projects. The McMath Pierce Solar Telescope, as featured in this image, is going to be the new Windows on the Universe Center for Astronomy Outreach. I call it WUCAO, W-U-C-A-O for short, but this is a multi-million dollar grant that we were awarded in 2019 to turn the decommissioned largest solar telescope uh, up until the Daniel K. Inouye telescope was uh, saw first light, so now the second largest telescope, into the most expensive center for astronomy outreach. So we have several thousand square feet of uh, floor space underneath the telescope where all of the 1960s giant servers used to be and all the uh, um, observatory equipment that we're going to turn into two theaters. One of them is going to be a science on a sphere for a data visualization. And this is like a 15 foot geodesic sphere that we can do data visualization on. We're going to build an in-house planetarium and then we're going to have an expansive history of the National Science Foundation and their role in astronomy museum. And the coolest thing about this is the solar telescope still works. So we're going to have, it's now the second largest, when I put this slide on, it was the largest solar telescope that's still operational and available for public use. So this is probably going to be the most expansive astronomy outreach center that we have. But how does that relate to astrophotographers? Well, the science on a sphere thing is full of one. It's really, really cool. We can talk about climate change. We can talk about lunar landscapes, Mars. But part of the data visualization is we can create 3D images from the astrophotographs that we take during the workshops or during the OTOP. So if you agree to let Kip Pete do that, we can project these images that we acquire onto and use it as part of our outreach programs and the science on a spheres are all integrated in a network throughout the entire world. So there's like hundreds of them in museums all over the world. So you could potentially have an image 
be on display in Shanghai, for example, as part of the astrophotography workshops. And then obviously our planetarium shows, we're gonna have killer images all coming just from Pitt Peak as part of our planetarium. And then finally, I mean, we have a working solar telescope that's 1.6 meters. So obviously we're gonna try and do something with that. Uh, so we're looking at ways to use the telescope for solar imaging as well. And we've talked about just a complete solar astrophotography workshop that focuses just on that. So, I mean, imagine using this massive, massive telescope for solar astrophotography. That'd be super cool. Casey, can I ask a couple of questions? Sure. I think we missed one there. Uh, which of the Kitt Peak telescopes were equipped with uh, AO? <clears throat> so, AO as in active optics or adaptive optics? Adaptive. Adaptive. Right now, none of them, believe it or not. <clears throat> But part of the experiment of the robotic adaptive optics that um, Caltech was doing was trying to figure out a way to roboticize and automate these older telescopes to be able to have adaptive optic systems put on them and retrofit it. So after the success of that experiment, I really wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of adaptive optic systems retrofitted on these telescopes in the near future. And for that matter, for a lot of observatories around the world. So that's so, good. Uh, when you take your, uh, a, this is an HA uh, yeah. image of the sun. Now, if someone were to come up there, are you gonna capture video, say 100 frames per second so they could be processed or is it a single still image? Uh, so for the astrophotography workshops where we're working with our um, the visitor center telescopes, we're doing exactly that. We have dedicated CMOS cameras that are doing 100 frames per second. Um, I use a ASI 290 and a ASI 174 for our solar workshop. And another question I had earlier, uh, are any of the data from Kit Peak, are they up on the public databases? That's a good question. So um the stuff from the visitor center is not because it's a nonprofit agency i have released some of them to the alumni facebook group that i have um associated with people who have come to the workshops but um the national science foundation data sets should be available because it's uh, publicly funded and open source or um, it has to be distributed openly um like the hubble space telescope does through the hla program I was thinking the uh, the mass database, Mikowski, where I think they have every telescope that, where the data is public available. And I just wonder whether the Kitt Peak, some of that data was up there. So the weird thing about Kitt Peak is out of those 22 telescopes, only three of them are still run by the National Science Foundation, where several of them have been kind of farmed out to university consortiums. So if it's still one of the National Science Foundation telescopes, yes, the data should be available on those websites. For some of them like the WIN, which is Wisconsin, Indiana, Yale, and um, NASA, uh, those ones probably will not be available because they're privately um, leased out from other universities. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> All right, so almost there, guys. Um, I mentioned the 24-inch telescope that will be coming along. We have the 24-inch Shreve telescope. It's an optical guidance system, RC telescope. It's an observatory class telescope and imaging platform. We actually have this entire observatory and telescope in hand, and we were getting ready to break ground on it right before COVID. <laughs> we had a lot of projects underway right before COVID. Um, so this is going to be a beautiful system where we are heavily contemplating using it as a remote observatory platform because the telescope itself is several, several feet off the ground. Um, and it's a beautiful telescope to use for remote imaging. So the camera is yet to be determined. We're looking at either one of the older KAF chips or maybe one of the new G-Sense 4040 chips. Um, to be paired with this telescope, uh, but it's going to follow the same rental system and data archive that we currently have set up for the remote imaging rental service that we have. 
So um, we still have to physically break ground on this one, like lay the observatory pad, rebuild the observatory. So this one is probably nine to 12 months out once we get back open and up and running again. But look for this one in the future because this will be a great platform for renting um, telescope time in the Northern Hemisphere. And again, I envision it running very similar to the operation that we have now where you're in control of the scope the entire night with the exposures, the filters, and the targets. Um, and then we'll send you all the data sets in the morning. And then finally, one of the things that we looked at during the pandemic is having uh, breaking off the Pix Insight workshop um, separately from the intermediate astrophotography workshop and having it as a one day virtual um, online workshop where the first day is instruction from start to finish, probably like a 10 hour class and getting started in Pix Insight, walking through a normal workflow, explaining how everything works. And then the second day, I envisioned it as having one-on-one -on -one time with me where you have maybe 30 minutes to an hour to go over your own data sets and ask any questions that you didn't have from the prior day. Again, um, assumes no prior knowledge. We talk about the recommended workflows. I'll provide Kit Peak data sets that we've used in the past, or you can work on your own. Um, again, once the visitor center officially opens up, this can be brought online the very next day. So look for this one in the near future. I'm hoping it'll be coming online in the fall very, very shortly. So with that, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation and I hope you can come up soon when it's safe to come up and uh, enjoy our nice, beautiful dark skies up there. Oh, thanks, Casey. Oh, that was great. I'm already thinking about uh just taking a trip up there just to see all the telescopes that in itself yeah. must be kind of you know worth the worth the trip yeah it's beautiful up there uh you didn't say if you are going to rent time on any of these telescopes you know what was the cost <laughs> um I would check our website so the overnight telescope observing program usually runs uh, depending on the number of guests you have it's really like a room and board situation um, that one's anywhere from $700 to $900 a night, whereas I like the workshop. I think it has a lot more value at $750 for three days, and it includes all your room and board and meals and everything else. Molly, did uh, did I miss any questions there? I was kind of glancing over. Um, don't think so. Yeah, okay. not a ton of chatter tonight. <laughs> well, I think we're all fascinated by Casey's presentation. So yeah, I think really. everybody is, uh, is looking at um, when they can go. <laughs> I'm actually cool. looking at, at some of the data sets. For example, on your solar image, if you capture CMOS 100 frames per second, you get a 30 second capture. That's a big file all on itself. I, I would. I would love to see some of that data if it were available. Is that possible? Yeah, I could probably look through my archives. And I know you guys had just recently started um, uh, doing like a data share on the website. So yeah, I can definitely hook up with you guys later and see if I can upload some of those. And if people want to get a hold of you, uh, how would they do that? That's a great question. Um, so. You can email me at goodastronomy at gmail.com is probably the easiest way. Um, same thing on social media, the at goodastronomy or via the website. My website has a uh, contact info is there as well. Um, did we, I can't remember. Uh, there was one question on uh, how, uh, how do people follow the observatory for updates on when they're gonna be letting people back in? That's a fantastic question. So we do have our social media accounts that'll come back online on Facebook and Instagram. And then our new website is www.visitkitpeak.org. Um, so if you just type in Google Visit Kit Peak, it'll get you to our website. And we have a big splash banner that says it's currently closed during due to COVID. Uh, but once that uh, we have a firm reopening date, we'll have information on there the second we know anything about it. Cool. Awesome. I think we're all looking forward to things opening up in a whole variety of yes. areas. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, even before you allow visitors, I imagine that you might be able to open up the remote. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so the visitor center staff, again, aren't technically mm -hmm. of the National Science Foundation. So we're not, I'm actually not allowed up there quite yet. Uh, but yeah, once I get back on the mountain, that'll probably be the first program that comes back online is the remote, um, the remote observing program. <laughs> uh, anything else we missed, Molly? I think we're all set. Yeah, I think we're all set. Uh, the only announcement, you know, once again, remind everyone to get their gorgeous galaxies in by, uh, I guess, the end of June. And yeah. I'm not sure we mentioned that next week, Ken Daly, Ken, I think he's here somewhere. He's going to uh, tell us about something reasonably important when we do astrophotography, and that's focusing. And I think we can all learn a little something about that. So I'm looking forward to that presentation. Yeah. And other than that, I think we're all set for this evening. Casey, thanks again, and you can hang with us a little bit after we close the show. And Molly, take us out. All righty. Good night, all.